get started. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started with our talk on how to fly smarter and get the best flights and seats and fares this year, 2023. Um, welcome everybody, we're so happy you could join us today. I'm Wendy Perrin with wendyperrin.com and we are a travel advice and trip planning website um, where you know a lot of people come to us asking where they should go and the smartest way to plan it and book it. And we suggest the best destination and local fixer for their needs. And so we get so many airline questions. A lot of these, uh, a lot of people who need help with airlines, we send over to Brett. Um, and I'm going to introduce him in a minute. But first, I just want to introduce you all to um, my colleagues, the fellow editors at wendyparent.com. First, we've got Brooke Wilkinson, who's our executive editor. Um, Brooke, you want to say hi? Hi, everyone. It's so good to see so many of you here tonight. Uh, we're looking forward to, to some good conversation. And um, it, we'd love to hear questions from you. I know some of you submitted questions ahead of time. We also have the Q&A box open, and we'll be grabbing questions from there throughout the, the next hour. Thank you. And I also want to introduce you all to Carolyn Spencer Brown, who um, I, I we actually were colleagues back when I, I was at TripAdvisor and, and Carolyn was editor in chief of Cruise Critic. And um, Carolyn, would you like to say a quick hi? Hi, it's, I, I'm thrilled to be here. I've gotten to meet Brett before because of a story that we worked on together. And he I can't wait to hear what he has to say. And uh, I can't wait to hear your questions. Awesome. Um, so, and just before we get started, I also want to thank our Wow Week sponsor, MedJet. Uh, MedJet is a global medical transport and crisis response provider. So, you know, it helps protect you from various emergencies, such as if you end up in a hospital abroad where you don't want to be, they will get you home fast to a doctor you trust. Um, they've also been, um, they were the first to come up with this program in the U.S., and they all, that kind of emergency assistance, and um, they also were, the, they came up with MedJet Horizon. My, I've had a family MedJet Horizon membership for, for many years now, and they were also the first to tr um, add global transport for COVID. So um, we're very grateful to MedJet for sponsoring WOW Week, and if you go to the website, wendyparent.com, you'll actually see they're offering a special discount of 10% on annual MedJet memberships. So, okay, so now that we're through with that, I want to introduce our special guest star, <laughs> Brett Snyder, founder of Cranky Concierge. Brett is one of my favorite uh, people in the travel world. And I don't know if, Brett, I don't know if you actually remember this, but we started our blogs the same year. You started the Cranky Flyer blog. Yeah. At the same time, I was a Condé Nast traveler and I started the Perrin Post blog. It was a long time ago. <laughs> it was a very, it was another lifetime. But then you realized there was this great need that travelers had that wasn't being met. And you founded Cranky Concierge. And it was quite similar because I realized there was this great need that travelers had that wasn't being met. And that's why I started wendyperrin.com. But um, uh, so for all of you who don't know Brett, and you should know him, um, what Cranky Concierge does is they are, it's like assistance from real human beings. You can plan your whole airline, you know, your flight, whenever you have a complicated itinerary, they'll make sure you get the right, you know, the, like basically the best value on the, the, the most convenient flight and route for your needs. Um, but also if there's some, problem, like you get stranded um, or, you know, your flight's been canceled or you just, you need to get home fast. Um, they offer unique, like urgent assistance, urgent airline assistance from a real human being. So it's just, did I explain it right, Brett? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, you know, you forgot to mention that we'll also deal with the 375 schedule changes that come in between the time you book and you fly. Yeah. <laughs> It's gotten weirder. It's gotten weirder uh, since the pandemic. It's gotten a lot tougher for people. So um, yeah, we do. We can deal with all that stuff. 
Well, thank you for everything you're doing on behalf of these airline travelers. So um, I hope you all will, you know, I'm sure you all have a ton of questions. We certainly got a lot of questions ahead of time and um, you can put them in the Q&A box. But for now, I'm just going to start out, Brett. I think something that is on a lot of people's minds is, you know, okay, are airfares ever going to drop? <laughs> like, it's been insane. What is going on? And when can we expect, like, any decent airfares ever? Yeah. Anywhere? <laughs> well, first, I want to say thanks for having me again for every year. I, I really do look forward to These are, like, moments in time that I remember <laughs> participating in these and, you know, sometimes in person and, and all those things. So um, it's great to be here. And I see on the attendee side, I see a lot of familiar names. So <laughs> it's good to see those as well here. Um, airfare, right. So it's not great news. <laughs> There's not really a lot that would point to airfare coming down significantly right now. Um, the airlines are effectively saying the same thing in most of their um, their earnings reports, you know, demand is strong, which means fares are high. So, you know, if, if you want to decode that when you see earnings releases, that's what they're talking about. And so, uh, you know, for the most part, the airlines have brought back capacity, but they've tried to be smarter about it. And they've tried to bring it back a little bit less than they might have otherwise done. Part of that's their own doing, but part of that is just an issue with um, a, a several different areas. One, the aircraft manufacturers, Boeing and Airbus, are having trouble delivering aircraft on time. And so you have a lot of airlines that um, retired airplanes during the pandemic, and they were planning on getting deliveries of new airplanes, and they haven't shown up, or at least not on time. And so there are fewer flights than they even want to have. Uh, and then if you live in a smaller city, then you probably already know this, that the, the pilot shortage that's really hit the regionals more than anyone. Um, we've seen dozens of cities on the smaller end lose service uh, from at least one airline, sometimes all airlines. And so that's made it really tough for people that live in smaller cities. And, uh, you know, there's just all these different issues that are sort of pushing on capacity, which keeps fares high. Uh, you know, if there's one bright spot, and I guess we'll see because this is just happening now, but uh, in Asia, China is finally reopening. And that means that there will be a lot more capacity coming to China. And then, of course, you can go beyond to Southeast Asia. And that's um, it, this, it, it was very artificially low because the agreement was uh, between the two countries during the pandemic it was effectively one flight a week. Um, for each airline, for the most part. And so now they're starting to come back in force and add a lot more flights. Um, so that should help at least to provide more capacity if you're willing to connect through China to get to places, uh, which, you know, there are a variety of reasons that people might be concerned about that. Um, not aircraft safety or anything, but just, you know, personal data and, and things like that. Um, but, you know, that may be an area that we see a little bit of relief. Uh, but other than that, you know, fares have just stayed remarkably high. And I know everybody's seeing that. Do you mean that we might see some relief if people want to go, let's say, to Southeast Asia, they connect in a in China, in the airport? Right, and, right. And so there might be more capacity and lower fares to get to Southeast Asia? Yes. And so Chinese airlines in general have always priced fairly low uh, compared to some of the competitors that are around. Uh, you know, when you think of Southeast Asia, there's obviously you can go through Korea or Japan, but there's Singapore Airlines uh, that has a lot of nonstops there. You even have Vietnam Airlines with flights from San Francisco now. And so the options generally involved a stop anyway, uh, but China was closed off not just as a destination, but also as a connecting point. And so now you have more of these flights that'll fly from the U.S. to China. Uh, and you can connect through there to places like Singapore, Bangkok, Vietnam, wherever it may be. Uh, and, you know, it just more capacity means fares should moderate as a general rule. Uh, but we don't really know. I mean, early early returns in China suggest that demand is is crazy there right now, as you'd expect for a place that's been locked down for so long. Um, so, you know, maybe there will be that huge surge that we saw here last summer where everyone just really wanted to get out and travel. Um, and so we don't really know for sure because this is all just happening now with China and the new flights are being added, but at least more flights are being added. 
Right, right. So I'm sure a, a, a question on a lot of people's minds also is um, when should they book their flights for summer travel? Summer international, like so many people want to go to Europe this summer and they're asking, well, when should they book their flight? And I'm thinking, well, yesterday. <laughs> so, so tell us. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if you're going to Italy in June, it was probably not yesterday, but like a couple months ago. <laughs> it's, you know, it, it's super popular. Uh, the usual hotspots have just gotten much busier. So places like Italy and, you know, the, the issue you have there as well is that even if you're not going to Italy, you know, let's say you're going to Hungary or, you know, something a little more off the beaten path compared to the traditional hotspots, you're still probably flying on the same flights over the Atlantic and then connecting beyond. And so those are things that, you know, there's just only so much capacity that's out there. Um, there's only so much they can add at this point because of some of the things we mentioned, like with, you know, shortages of aircraft and, and things like that. So, uh, summer, is, it's a good time to be looking. And this is earlier than you might normally think about that, but uh, especially in the peak of summer, uh, you know, summer for air travel tends to start to really fall off kind of mid-August. And so if you're looking to travel after mid-August, then it's less of an issue. Um, but it's it's looking like a really busy summer to Europe right now. And, and the airlines are keeping fares high. Uh, so, you know, there's always that possibility that they guess wrong and and it won't book up as well as they hoped, but I don't think I'd put my money on that right now because early bookings are apparently looking strong according to what the airlines are saying. So, some airlines are introducing these cool non-stops to very interesting places, you know, like the way United, I, I, and they're available in the like late spring through early mm -hmm. fall. They're there for the summer. So are, how are fares on some of those? I mean, there's some really well, I mean, like United's flying to, you know, Mallorca and the Azores mm -hmm. and Dubrovnik, you know, nonstop from Newark. This year they're adding Malaga, which is a great one to add to the list there. Um, they've focused more this year. Last year they added a ton of cool cities. They had Tenerife and um, uh, the, the Ponte Delgada, um, you know, a few of these places. Uh, this year, it's it's more about extra flights. So they've added more flights to Paris, to London, things like that, because they know it's just going to be huge demand on the, the basic routes that are out there. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, prices on those nonstops, they are hoping that they will perform as well or potentially even better than some of these other ones. They're not necessarily flying them daily, Sometimes it's less than daily. So they're really trying to reach that niche market of people that want to fly nonstop, find real value in doing that. And, you know, that that can mean that they try to keep the fares higher. Some of these are also not on big airplanes. Uh, they're still using 757s on some of these, you know, relatively small, especially in the business class cabin where they just don't have a lot up there. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know that fares will be any better, but the ability to save uh, yourself from all the hassle of having to connect again. Uh, you know, if you live in New York or if you're on United, you want to go to Malaga, like you don't have that many options. Uh, you know, th this will make it a lot easier for people that are doing that. Uh, but there's also, you know, people can keep in mind, I, I think I, I think it was today I just saw that uh, Norse Atlantic, which is sort of the reincarnation of Norwegian uh, long haul, uh, Norwegian has shrunk back down to just do short haul within Europe, but this is people who used to work for Norwegian, picked up the airplanes, and are now calling it Norse Atlantic. Uh, they just announced New York Rome today. So, you know, they, there are other people that are trying to fly these trunk routes as well. And you have, uh, I mean, some airlines doing some really interesting stuff. Uh, SAS is this summer, they're starting to fly from Newark to Aalborg in Denmark and to what I think in, I think we call it Gothenburg, but in Sweden, uh, in Swedish, I have learned it is called Yetabori, very different than it looks spelled. Um, but so there are definitely some of these cool secondary markets, but there are ten, they tend to be on smaller airplanes. So, you know, not a lot of capacity. So fares generally will stay on the higher side, unless it's a low cost operator, like a Norse Atlantic or something. Right. So you, you, you know, if people do need to connect, if they do need to make connections, especially maybe like a domestic connection to an international flight, what advice do you have in terms of, you know, 
not missing your connection. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, build in a build in a longer layover. Uh, that that's the easiest thing to do. But ultimately, it depends on each person's willingness to deal with risk and you know ability to to suffer through some of these things because and this is what we always tell people you know you can fly with as little as a 35 to 45 minute connection on some of these airlines uh domestic to international not if you have to go through customs and all that uh the airlines will schedule that and for some people this is great they want to spend no time in the airport they don't care if they miss the flight fine they'll deal with it but that's really important to them to just not have to sit around other people, this will stress them out until the end of time. And it'll it can ruin the trip if you just spend your time worrying about all this. And so we have, you know, a lot of clients as well that just want to take that next earlier flight and, and not have to have such a tight connection. So for the people that really are worried about that, just take an earlier connection. Uh, and it can be pretty easy, especially if it's like a Delta through Atlanta, where you know they have flights to almost every city many, many times a day. And so it's not that hard to just get that earlier connection. Um, but uh, that's that's the, the best thing you can do if you're worried about a connection is just give yourself time. That's it. Um, I know people who are spending the night, like they're doing an sure. overnight, you know, they're flying to, from wherever the big gateway is where they're leaving the US on their, especially if, they, if it's not a frequent international flight. If it's a flight yep. that's only once a day or once every three days or something. Yeah, we've definitely seen that as well from people who are just really worried about it. And, you know, some of it will also depend on where people are coming from. I mean, I, I'm here in Southern California. The flights from LA to Newark, for example, if I were flying United, they tend to operate pretty well on time. They're using the same wide bodies that are going to land and then go internationally. Um, you know, they, they tend to get a higher priority. But if you're coming from a small city on a regional jet, then those may get a lower priority if the weather's bad. And uh, so, you know, that's something you can take into account as well, just in, in determining how much time to give yourself. Uh, but it's the overnight thing. It's not bad. If you have the time, it's really not a bad idea. It sounds funny to some people, but as long as you keep the connection under 24 hours, it will still price as a connection instead of a stopover. So it'll be the same price. Uh, and, you know, depending on where you're going, I mean, if you're connecting through JFK, a night at that TWA hotel, it's just so nice. It's very old school glamour and you get great views of the runways and you're right there. You know, it's a lot of fun. Um, not so much at Newark <laughs> if, if, you, if you're spending the night there. So that's something you can think about as well. Everyone I know who's spending the night at Newark just comes to my house. I'm right. Away, so. <laughs> Not known for their airport hotels. Uh, it's... Right. But it's but you know what? It's easy to get into New York City. I mean, you can go have a sure. night in the city. Honestly, that's what I would do. It's 20 minutes on, on, on New Jersey Transit to Penn Station, and you can have a fun night in New York. That's what Absolutely. I would do. And a lot of that will depend, too. Do you have check bags? Uh, you know, that's something that people have to think about, because if you have an overnight, uh, you usually won't be able to check your bag through uh, to just leave it at the airport. So for some people, if they are at Newark, yeah, very easy to get to New York City, but almost easier if you just have that airport hotel, you check in, dump your bags, and then you can just go into the city and have a good night. Uh, but it it just depends on what people are traveling with. Everyone's different. Yeah. Well, I've, those are, I've asked a lot of questions. I mean, Carolyn, um, Brooke, what are the burning questions on your minds? Well, we have lots of questions from, from the audience. I'll start with one of those um, because it's something I've wondered myself too. So Judy asked, how does one avoid the use of cookies used by airlines to track your searches? The price rises if you don't choose the first offer. So this is something I've heard of. Not You can tell us, Brett, if this is really happening, that if you go and look at a flight and price it out and then decide you know, you're not ready to book it and come back a week later, do they know who you are and have they raised the fare because of that? Yeah. Um... I have yet to hear of an airline that admits to doing this. Um, I also tend not to give them the benefit of the doubt at being that good at this, <laughs> where they, they actually can figure that out. More often than not, what happens is prices just change. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, availability is, it's a really complicated system that they use. Um, probably not an ideal system, uh, but it's the one that they've got. And so they have very many different price points. Uh, and, you know, there could be availability there one minute and not the next. And so more often than not, that's what's happening. Uh, you know, if yeah. for most part, the airlines, they've talked about doing these things, but the idea being, if you log into your account or something, then you'll get benefits, not penalized. And I still haven't really seen much of that happening yet. Um, they want to do more of that. But if you are worried about cookies, you, you can always compare side by side. You can use an incognito window and you can do that compared to your regular login. Um, you know, we, there have been a couple of times that we've seen this happen and the airlines say, oh, we were just doing some A-B testing and one person got one, one got another, and it wasn't something that was purposeful. Uh, so, you know, th there's no trick to that other than if you want, you can try it once when logged in and once with an incognito window uh, or in a different browser, uh, something like that, uh, you know, that then that can at least help you to double check. But um but probably it, it, if you waited a week, the fares went up. This <laughs> is really yeah. the moral. Oh, a week is a lifetime. I mean, the fares are fares themselves. Well, for international, it's it's usually once a day, but domestically it's four times a day. They, the fares themselves get updated. But then you also just have availability. So if if you had two seats here and someone booked those two seats, then the fare looks like it went up. Um, just because the low fare isn't available anymore. So it can change at any time. And a week is is a lifetime uh, for those kind of things. So, yeah. We, we are getting a number of questions about um, miles and points. And I just wanted to mention that that's its own enormous topic that we're going to be covering on Fridays, um, during Friday's talk um, with Gary Leff. So um, we might not get to those questions today, but I hope you can all, those of you who are curious about um, booking flights with miles or points, come on Friday and Gary's going to um, answer all those questions. Brooke, I see a good one for um, for Brett, um, uh, and obviously because I have a cruise background, the cruise caught my eye. David writes that we have a cruise in mid-April that ends in Amsterdam at 9 a.m. on a Thursday and a 12 noon flight home. Is that reasonable? And I, I just shudder at the thought, but Brett, what do you say? It's probably reasonable. I mean, each each cruise line should tell you as far as I know here in Carolyn, you probably know better, but they should tell you when to, to start looking at flights home, right? Yeah. And so, you know, if you get off at nine and I'm far from a cruise expert, but I know you get assigned different times to get off. And if you have the early time or, or you can ask for the early time, if you have an early flight or something like that, um, you know, thinking about where the port is compared to where the airport is. And, uh, you know, also take into account the, the problems that Amsterdam had this past summer, they yes. say they're beyond it, but my God, Amsterdam was okay for connections, but for origins, people were in security lines for hours. Hours. Uh, and so they say they've got it, but this time last year, they were pretty confident too. So yeah. <laughs> who's to know? Um, but, you know, that is, that is a risk. Um, some cruise lines, if you book through them, uh, you know, that might give more protection, it does. Uh, yeah. They offer that. But uh, otherwise, it's really just about how much tolerance you have for risk on that. And, you know, I, I don't think it's necessarily unreasonable, but it's it's probably it's cutting it pretty close. <laughs> I, I would say, David, uh, I'm going to agree with Brett on that one. If you can uh, push your flight out a couple more hours, um, I think that would be wise. You just never know. You don't know. God forbid the gangway gets stuck and they can't get people off. You, you just never know. There are a lot of variables on, on debarkation day. And I think you should, uh, you know, plan to spend some time in the lounge in the airport or, or find a nice cafe and um, and just chill out a little bit and relax so that you're not flustered or. I know, that, the night. I know that's tough, especially for Europe, because so many of the flights back from Europe come earlier in the day. Yeah. Uh, you know, easy to get back to the East Coast later in the day. But if you're on the West Coast like I am, there just aren't that many flights unless you want to start connecting and get home at midnight and all this stuff. And so I can definitely understand 
why people would want to try and make that flight. Uh, but you know, may, maybe it's worth staying a, a night in Amsterdam too. Yeah, it, it, I think so. I mean, a you lot of wreck your whole vacation before you barely, you know, finished it. But it also goes back to how much you care. If, if you're yeah. someone that's going to worry about it, then definitely don't book that. But if you're I someone who it. says, eh, if I make it great, if I don't, so I come back the next day. All right. <laughs> that's fine too. It's, it's a personal yeah. thing. Thank you. Thanks, David. Brett, someone, uh, Lin Linda asked, um, can Cranky get better cash airfares than what I see online? Can you talk a little bit about how your airline geniuses find the fares they do? <laughs> so we can never guarantee anything like that. Um, there are so many different places that people can look for airfare, um, you know, down to what they call bucket shops, which can often be you know, in, in specific cultural areas that people have these deals, like um, you want to go back to New Jersey again, Wendy, there, there are a lot of these that go to India, for example, where, you know, there's such a, a large population there. So um, a lot of people going back to India, you can go through them. Uh, you can probably get something for cheaper. There are a whole host of issues. Some of those are not reliable. Uh, if you have a problem, refundability, there could be a lot of issues with that. But if you're just talking about price, there are a lot of places that you might be able to try and go if you're willing to put a ton of effort into that. So we never want to say like, we will always be able to give you the cheapest possible price in the world because we know that no one can really claim that uh, even if they wanted to. Uh, so, but, you know, there are several different tools that we have that we can look at. Um, you know, if, if you're going online, if you're just looking at an online travel agent, they have an algorithm that will just punch in. These are the best options that we have, and they'll limit it and say these are, you know, the top 50 or 100 or whatever it might be. These are the options that the system spit out. Um, in our case, what we can do is we can actually go and, and build itineraries manually. So we can look at the fares and we can say, okay, this fare on United, well, this will allow you to connect onto uh, Croatia Airlines to get to Dubrovnik. And um, you know, maybe business class on that leg is, is not available at the right fare to be able to get the cheapy, but coach is. And so some of these online systems won't look at that. They won't look at kind of mixing and matching. And maybe someone doesn't care for that hour, hour hop if they're in coach or not, if you can save thousands of dollars. Uh, there are also different ways you can look at it, uh, that we can look at it. You have code shares, right? So you could book you know, you start out with Air France and then it's Delta. and it, it, It's a really complicated way of doing things that a lot of the, the online systems just aren't going to pick up in their basic searches. Uh, there are also, there's the whole world of consolidators as well, uh, which there are plenty of reputable consolidators that are out there. We work with some of them. Sometimes they will have better fares. Uh, sometimes they won't. It, it really just depends. Um, but you know, that's that's another option that you can look at if, if you're not working with someone directly, these might not pop up if you just go to Expedia or something like that. Uh, or it certainly won't pop up if you go to the airline directly. Uh, but, um, you know, these are there are places that are out there that you, you definitely want to do your homework if you use a consolidator, make sure that it's one that's reputable because you can really get burned with that. Uh, but, you know, those are other places that you can look as well, or, you know, we look at those when, when we're doing these things. But ultimately, when you get into the really high fare environment that we have right now, there are just fewer options to get these types of deals because the airlines don't need to do much discounting. They don't need to try and pull in, uh, you know, a, a lot of the, uh, the capacity that's there, they know they're going to fill. And so it happens more in the off peak times where they need to to fill more seats and try and do that then they like to use some of these separate types of outlets um but that's you know we can look into some of those and if you're asking the difference between us and, and others uh but one thing i would say for sure is that if you are looking around when you find what you're looking for if it is something that you can book directly with the airline uh versus booking through a third party like an expedia or a price line, do do book direct if you can. Um, you know, a, a traditional agent, someone that has you know good communication uh, and will help you with these things, that's a great place to book. But Expedia and Priceline do not have 
much in the way of good communication. They don't really have uh, strong customer service at all. So it's great for getting the fare you want and just being done with it. But if you need to make a change, if there's a, a significant schedule change, there's a problem, operational issues, um, they are going to just not really be very helpful at all. And so, you know, you can't always do that, especially if you have multiple airlines, you can't book direct with one airline on a single ticket because they won't necessarily show that. Uh, but if you can avoid those third party online booking sites, that's going to save you a lot of trouble down the road. Yeah. yeah. Jason asked, how do you get leverage over an airline? And I guess that's kind of one answer to that would be what you're saying, that the, the, the kind of the closer to them you're booking, the more leverage you have. I mean, there's, there's not really leverage over an airline. Unfortunately, you're you're kind of beholden to their their uh, their rules. I mean, there are some places, for instance, in Europe, there are government regulations about what happens if you're delayed or your flight's canceled and how they have to treat you. And so, those are things the airlines will not volunteer to tell you about because they don't have to. So you can educate yourself for sure, and that helps to get. Leverage tenacity is really important. Uh, you know, it, you may have to do several rounds with an airline to get that compensation for the European Union uh, rules, for example, because they'll try and find ways that oh, this this doesn't apply for this reason or that reason, or it's just some you know call center that they're just processing these as fast as they are, and they're not even really looking through it and paying close attention to it. So, uh, you know, doing your homework, doing your due diligence. If you really want to get into it, you can you can read the contract of carriage. It is really boring, I'll tell you right now. But if you're looking for the rules that you can hold the airlines to, that's where they keep this information. And these are legally binding agreements. So, uh, you know, you can look at those things. The more you can educate yourself on what they're required to provide you, then I don't know that I call it leverage, but the more ability you'll have to get whatever you're you're trying to get done mm -hmm. um, but in terms of other things if it's just looking for you know kindness or you know this doesn't we're having this problem we just need someone who's willing to do this to help us and it, it, if it's not in the rules uh, your best friend is hang up call again <laughs> and just mm -hmm. hope you can find someone to help not so easy to do if you've been waiting on hold for three hours already but uh, you know, sometimes, unfortunately, that's the name of the game, just trying as many different channels as you can. You can try Twitter, you can try phone, you can, uh, you, you can try email sometimes, you can go in the app. Uh, some airlines have chat. There, you can be at the airport, you can talk to the agent. There are a lot of different ways to, to try and reach them. And of course, if someone's booked through you and your team, they'll be doing that for the, the traveler. Sure. Sure. But it also, I mean, from our perspective, yes, we know the rules. So we know what they have to do and what they don't have to do. And then we can fight them if they're not doing what they need to be doing. But ultimately, you know, we don't have the ability to, for example, let's say your flight was canceled and there's another flight on American. I'm just picking random airlines. And then they, you know, they don't want to put you on it for whatever reason. We can't make them put you on it. Um, so, you know, there is a limit to what we or anyone else can do. Uh, I mean, we can certainly help process a refund, know if you're eligible for a refund, buy a new ticket on a different airline, all those types of things. Um, but ultimately, the airline does hold most of the cards here. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's knowing what their rules are, fighting them on those specific points, uh, and, you know, just trying to push through until you can get it done. Mm -hmm. Here's a question that's kind of near and dear to my heart, and both Jackie, Jacqueline, and Laura asked it as well in our in our queue. Um, what's the strategy to finding bargains for business class? <laughs> well, it, yeah. So <laughs> that's heartwarming. <laughs> it's a it's a it's a tough one, right? Because the advice is different in in times where demand isn't so strong. Just as I was saying before. The airlines don't really need to put a lot out there to get people on board at a bargain right now. They're selling a lot of their seats. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's less incentive for them now than there is at, during COVID. There were plenty of bargains to be had right? if you wanted to get on that airplane. Um, and so that's that's certainly one of the issues uh, with that. But 
Well, these are some of the same strategies that I had mentioned before about, you know, if, if you do trust a local bucket shop that may exist, if you're going to a place uh, like, you know, if there's a large ethnic population in one area, you might be able to find that. But there are hazards to doing that as well. Um, consolidators are, are possible if you can find them. A couple other things that I'll add to that, though, that are different here. Uh, one is depending on what your plan is, uh, but you know, sometimes just trying to combine it with hotel. Uh, if you have a couple of nights a hotel, then it can count as uh, a package, even if it's not your whole trip. Uh, obviously, Wendy and her, uh, you know, wow listers are planning your trip. But if you have a couple of nights hotel, uh, or even a car rental, sometimes uh, then they can use some of the package fares that airlines file that are uh, only cool. with packages. Again, don't you know? Don't get your hopes up right now because there's. Those aren't there aren't a ton of those out there right now, but these are things you can do uh, if you if you're able to meet those minimums, whatever they may be, which you may not always know. But you can go. There are plenty of package operators that sell air uh, that you know you can think about, like Pleasant Holidays or someone like that. Um, that you know sometimes they can get a better deal because they can package it with a hotel. Probably doesn't make sense if you don't need the hotel at all. Um, but if you're going to get a hotel anyway and you can maybe put a couple nights in there, that's a possibility. Um, and um, let's see, there was one other thing I was going to say. Oh, another thing you can try, um, you know, depending upon what you really need out of your business class here, there are airlines that have, for example, premium economy that is like a domestic first class and not quite a business class, but you can get a deal on that. Some of the low fare carriers, I, I mentioned North Atlantic, they're, they're starting New York to Rome this summer. Um, you know, if you live somewhere else, you can just buy a ticket to New York and then buy a separate ticket. There are a whole host of other issues that come with that. You probably want that night in New York that we were talking about earlier because you just want that extra buffer. Um, but if you try and get to the main gateway, and then fly to a main gateway on the other side, then you know that that's a way that you can you can try and get that as well. Um, so you know it, it's tough to to really find true bargains right now from what we've seen. Doesn't mean they're not out there, especially in some markets. And maybe as we talked about China, Southeast Asia, you know maybe some of those Chinese carriers will will have some more opportunities here soon. Um, but it is definitely a tougher thing to do right now. I'm so excited to see a question here about South America, because I love to know the situation nowadays, because South America is a place that we think are going to have, they're going to be, you know, less overwhelming tourist numbers this year for a variety of reasons that actually Brooke explained in yesterday's talk. Um, and, and, um, um, Dennis here asks, we are going to Montevideo, Uruguay from Vancouver in November, what route would you suggest for us business class? I'm just, can you tell us a little bit about, about answer Dennis's question, but also, you know, the South America situation. What are the, yeah. best, what are the best routes and flights to South America? Yeah, South America is difficult right now. And, and I, I mean, it's, it's almost like, um, it's like bifurcated. So you have the big cities that are relatively easy to get to. Um, relatively, I say, and I'll explain why in a second, but, you know, the Buenos Aires, the Santiago, um, Lima, although Lima's, Peru's got its own issues right now, um, but, you know, some of these, these true hub operations for the airlines that are down there, uh, those tend to be relatively easy to get to for the most part, but, I don't know if people remember this, a few years ago, uh, LATAM and American used to be partners, they broke up and LATAM now partners more with, or partners with Delta instead. It was a whole thing, all kinds of drama. But um, the problem is that LATAM still has most of their flights to Miami uh, because that is, you know, the, the Northern hub of South America. Uh, and Delta has very little into Miami. Whereas American had a hub in Miami. So we used to have all these really good connecting options through Miami from American onto LATAM to get down there. And now we just don't really have that anymore. And that's really frustrating because LATAM is huge in South America. And so it makes it really difficult for people. Um, that has, has been a big issue. Um, there are 
some lower cost operators that have nice uh, business class products that are flying uh, into the U.S. The one that comes to mind mostly is Azul, uh, which is Brazilian. They fly Fort Lauderdale and I believe Orlando, and they have flat beds and it's nice into Brazil. Um, and you know they can connect to JetBlue and I think they work with United. Uh, but you know ultimately, just the the connectivity isn't as easy as it used to be, and certainly not as easy as it is going to Europe, where you just have so many different gateways that go there. So. Uh, you know, depending upon the experience you're looking for on the flight, one of my favorite go-tos is Copa through Panama City, because Copa does fly to a lot of destinations in the U.S. that you might not normally see, um, you know, nonstop flights into Latin America. And they also fly to an incredible number of cities in South America that, makes it really easy to get a one-stop connection. Uh, Panama City also is a really easy place to connect. Uh, the problem is only a few of their flights actually have flatbeds and they're pretty long flights. Like Panama City to Montevideo, uh, if we're using that example, I mean, that's a that's a good seven plus hours. <laughs> it's, it can be a, a long flight. Um, so it may not be for everyone to go that way. Uh, the other problem you have is, you know, we have a lot of people we've seen that want to go into Argentina and uh, the government makes it very difficult. They have two Buenos Aires airports. And so most of the flights, well, all the flights from the U.S. go into the big international ESAISA. But most of the domestic flights go from uh, Aeroparque, which is downtown. And getting between the two is not easy. Um it just it makes it challenging to con to connect a lot of these pieces together, uh, and and that's something that I think has frustrated a lot of people. Definitely, we have seen strengthening of flights between the U.S. and <clears throat> the big gateways. So it is easy to get to Sao Paulo. It's easy to get to Lima. It's, it's easy to get to easy-ish to get to Buenos Aires, um, Santiago, where Latam is based. That one's pretty easy. Uh, but the options have skewed more often to a low cost carrier uh, type of experience. And I'll give you an example, Avianca, uh, which purchased Taka, if people know Taka from uh, the old Central America days, they, they were focused there in San Salvador, Avianca based in Bogota. Um, they still have a handful of airplanes with flat beds. They don't even sell them anymore. They don't sell a business class. They've gone to a true low cost operation. You can pay extra for a seat, like a like an add on to it. Uh, but they used to be a good option for people. And now if you want that true premium product, it's not there anymore. So definitely been a, an interesting few years in Latin America. And you know what I would say the best option is, is to get into one of the major cities that has good connectivity and then maybe spend the night or break it up, do something, and you can connect over. When I think about uh, Vancouver to Montevideo, that is definitely a, a tough one to, to connect the dots on. Um, you know, what may be a good option is, is you can do, uh, from there you can do Delta, uh, try and go through Atlanta to uh, maybe into Buenos Aires, and then um, if you want to stay the night there, you'll have to switch airports probably, depending on the time of day, time of year, and then you can get to Montevideo. Uh, Latam may be an option too. Sometimes you can come down through LA, which is, is nice for people on the West Coast, so they don't have to take that really long domestic flight, or not domestic from Canada, but you know what I mean, uh, and uh, and then fly from there to Santiago and connect over. So you have a longer time on, on the big airplane. Um, but we see this, we see a lot of this of people that want to want to connect the dots, and it just doesn't connect as easily as it used to. Right, you mentioned earlier um, Norse and and Azul are you know some low cost and some startups. Some have been around longer. Uh, what's what do you think about booking on those? You know, how long are they going to be around? I mean, for instance, I'm my family's going to Iceland in the summer, and there's play that's just starting yeah. up. You know, do we chance it? Are they going to be around in June? That's the, uh, that's the million dollar question. Um, so, summer to Europe in particular. It's when they make money. 
if they're going to make money, it's when they make money. So if they make it to summer, they will probably make it through summer <laughs> as, a, as a general rule. Uh, you know, if, if they're not going to make it, it's, it's this time of year when things start to fall apart for them. So an airline like Play, it sounds like maybe they're doing okay right now. I mean, Norwegian failed spectacularly. It was a bit um, hidden by the pandemic uh, when a lot of things were going wrong, but they were in deep trouble before that. Uh, now, North Atlantic, you know, tried to pick up the airplanes for cheap and try and run something similar. Um, we don't really have a lot of visibility into these airlines. It's not like they're necessarily publicly listed and we can see their financials or anything like that. So, you know, th this is where the best option is to try and, and just make sure you have travel insurance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily hesitate to book them, but I would make sure that I have coverage that's going to carrier that's going to cover that carrier's default. And the, the insurance companies will have a list of, you know, what airlines they cover and some they may not. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, make sure they're covered. Uh, and then, you know, that's kind of the best way to approach some of these airlines. Uh, someone like Azul, you know, going to Latin America, they've been around much longer. They're enormous in Brazil. They're one of the biggest airlines in Brazil. They just don't touch the U.S. much. So, you know, I'd worry less about someone like them, probably. Uh, but there are, you know, there's there are some that seem to defy the laws of, of physics, like one that I'm always amazed at is uh, La Compagnie, which flies from New York, actually Newark to Paris, and they do Milan and I think occasionally Nice. It's all business class. Um, it's a nice experience. They've been around for years. No one else has ever made this work, and I'm not sure how they're doing it, <laughs> uh, but they've been around for a while. So that's one thing you can do is just look, you know, do, do they have staying power if they've been around for long enough? And scan the headlines, see if you can find any mention of, you know, carrier warns of imminent doom or something like that. Um, Robert has asked if there are other airlines similar to Norse. Um, are there just like a couple you could mention that are sort of like lesser known or, or just surprising airlines that you should consider to get to Europe? If we're talking about Europe, I mean, there, there are not, there were more. <laughs> they, they're not, they're not really doing much anymore. There are some airlines that act sort of as, um, as hybrid uh, in a different way. There's, there's one, for example, called Neos, which is out of Italy. And they fly to New York. I think maybe it's just New York now. Uh, but they are more of one of those like package arms, like one of the old school, like Thomas Cook style of, of operators that do that. Um, you know, if you're specifically going where they're going, uh, you can look at them, but you know, maybe not the best option. Some of the ones that are more likely to, to be more useful are uh, some of maybe the, I don't want to call them second tier uh, traditional carriers, but TAP Air Portugal out of, out of Portugal, they tend to have lower fares historically. Now, the government is behind them now. They're trying to privatize them again. It's a whole thing. So you never know where it's going to go eventually, but um, that's when you can look at. There's always the, the tried and true Iceland Air option through Iceland, which, you know, they don't have flatbeds, but also that's not a very long flight because you're going through Iceland. And so, um, you know, that's a good one to look at. Um, one that that I tend to like if, if they're flying where you need to go, which is sometimes the case, but Condor is one uh they are they're german they're built more for the europeans though it's it's where do the europeans want to go not where do the americans want to go uh but they do they have gone into bigger airports so they fly to la um they fly to uh, jfk now uh, in addition to some of the secondary types of markets that they've flown before um, they're taking delivery of new airplanes and they have nice flatbeds on them. So Condor is, is a good one to look at. They also partner with Alaska. So if you're on the West Coast, uh, you can connect up through Seattle with Alaska onto Condor, have some options there. So that's always a good one. Uh, and another one, which uh, sounds a little funny, but you have to be willing to endure a little bit of pain, but uh, Turkish Airlines, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you're overshooting where you want to go for the most part if you're going to Europe, but they will sell you a ticket to Paris or wherever it may be. Uh, it's going to be more flight time, but they will sometimes have that discounted just because they know it's it's not going to be the most ideal way to go. 
so, you know, you can look at something like that. Uh, Brett, what about um, Eurowings Discover? I actually flew them a couple of weeks ago to Frankfurt. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it was okay. So they're, they're Lufthansa. They're owned by Lufthansa. It's Lufthansa's 10,370th attempt at like a low cost operation. <laughs> um, they have, they had, they've had so many that they've tried and they usually last for a year and then they change their mind. Uh, but, you know, they've put those on routes that are there at like Philadelphia to Frankfurt. Right. They've put these on. pulled out of Philly. So that's where we're, they we're just at put there. them on it instead. So the reason yeah. they do it, it's lower cost to them. They have a lesser product. Uh, they have more density. So a lot more coach seats on those. It's much more of a leisure focused type of product. Yeah. They're fine. It's, Luf it's Lufthansa. Um, and you can book it as a Lufthansa flight too, as, as code share. Um, but uh, yeah, you can look at them directly. Uh, you know, if you want to see an option that they might have too, for sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's definitely an option. And I would say let, let's not ignore the Pacific either. There are a couple there that are worth looking at. Um, one is uh, is called Zip Air. I don't even understand where they come up with these names, but uh, Zip Air is actually a new effort by Japan Airlines to do a low cost operation. And so they fly uh, from LA and I think San Jose to Tokyo. Um, they can be lower lower cost. They actually have a nice flat bed up front too, if I remember right. Um, and there are a couple of startups that are trying to be more premium, but uh, it, assuming they do actually come to the U.S. as they planned, uh, there's one called Air Premia, which is out of uh, South Korea. Um, there's Starlux out of Taiwan, which I don't think they've started the U.S. yet. Um, but there are some of those. <laughs> and, you know, if you look at Australia as another one, uh, they have Jetstar, which is Qantas's low fare operator. Uh, they fly out of Honolulu, so you could get yourself to Honolulu and and then connect from there. It, it depends on how much pain you're willing to put up with, um, but you know there are there are options out there, just not quite as many as as there used to be. And even on the low cost operators, the fares are still going to be higher than you would have seen a, a few years ago. So speaking of Australia, Brett, um, Benita has asked. She says, Qantas business class is exorbitant. Your thoughts on best options for Australia? Yeah, Australia, it is crazy expensive. I mean, in a, in a world of expensive airfares, Australia has been really just in the stratosphere. Uh, and there just aren't a lot of options. And that's the problem. So, you know, when I think about other ones that you can consider, um, Hawaiian is a good option. It may require an overnight in Honolulu, but you're in Hawaii. So <laughs> seems like a good trade-off. Um, sometimes it does require that. They fly to uh, Melbourne and they do fly to Sydney. And I think they stopped Brisbane, if I remember right, but they did. They also do Auckland as well. Um, another one is um, uh, Fiji Airways. Uh, they fly from LA and San Francisco and I believe Vancouver uh, through Nandi in Fiji. You can connect through there and actually several cities. They even go deeper in, like they fly to Adelaide on some days and things like that. Um, so that's another one that you can try and look at. But it's still expensive across the board. Like no matter what you try, it's still expensive. It, it, I mean, if you really want to get a cheaper deal and you're willing to go out of your way, you can go through Asia. I mean, you can fly like Philippine Airlines through Manila. Uh, it's out of the way, but they will often give a better deal. Sometimes the Chinese Airlines too, we'll see how that comes along. It's a lot of extra flying, uh, but you know, if, if the price is right, it might be something that people are uh, willing to consider. Uh, well, you know, Al has, Al has an interesting idea here. He says, um, when they took Qantas to Sydney in 2019, they thought premium economy was as comfortable, if not more comfortable, than business class on most domestic airlines they've been on. So that's interesting. I mean, there's always that option yeah. of premium economy, you know? Absolutely. When, when you know, there's so many different definitions that people use of what does premium economy mean? And, you know, people think of like economy plus on United, it's just extra legroom. But if you're talking about true premium economy, it is like domestic first class, sometimes better, you might have a foot rest or something. Uh, and you'll certainly have better food. Uh, but you know, if you don't need that flat bed, 
then premium economy, it's a great way to go because you still get priority boarding. You get a little bit separated from everyone else. You'll have more of a, a luggage allowance and all that. Uh, so that can be really nice. And while it's not as useful for Australia since you fly overnight both ways, uh, sometimes to Europe, what we see if people are working in a budget and they can't really find something that fits what they want, um, you know, fly eastbound to Europe overnight, fly that in a flatbed. And then you can fly back during the daytime in a premium economy seat because you don't care about the bed as much. So business one way, premium economy the other. You can start to piece those things together and, and see what you come up with. Brett, uh, there are a lot of search engines out there that you can use to, to look for flights. Robert asked about ITA Matrix. There's obviously Kayak, Google Flights. Um, are, will you get different results with one or the other? There one, is there one you prefer? Oh yeah, you'll get different ones? results. <laughs> you, it's, they all have their, their algorithms that they use to determine what they're gonna show you. The purest is ITA Matrix. You can't actually book there is the difference or they can't, they won't even, you know, push you out to someone who can book for you. So you need to find someone who can book whatever you find through Matrix. Um, I still love the old Matrix, uh, which they say will be phased out sometime. They haven't done it yet, fortunately, uh, but there's no better way to customize what you wanna see on that. It gets very complex. There are all different kinds of routing codes and airline codes. You don't have to use that, but you can, and you can really try to narrow in on what it is that you want, but it takes some work. Um, and then you have to find out where to book it. So <laughs> that's the other problem. Uh, but, you know, Kayak, Google Flights, they're all going to show you a good base of what you can consider uh, as, you know, a, a good range of fares, a good start with options. Um, any of them would do well as a first place to start mm -hmm. and it'll at least give you the lay of the land uh, but you know then you can determine later how do you want to try and tweak it and where do you want to to do it but for me if i am looking for just where i'm going to get the best options in an online uh, website it's it's going to be matrix because it's so flexible what you can do with it uh, but you know the the old matrix, which I think is still at oldmatrix.itasoftware.com. Uh, they moved it over there when they put the new version of matrix there. Um, you know, they, they have a lot of warnings on there saying it's going to die soon, but they've never actually done it. So we'll keep fingers crossed. It keeps living for now. There's a question here from Molly. Are seat prices at their lowest when a carrier releases its schedule? Almost never. So that's a good, that's a good question. Um, you know, a lot of people think, and award travel is different. So maybe, maybe that's a question for Gary, if you're coming back on Friday, um, some airlines do release their availability right when they start. But when it comes to prices, the airlines just put their schedules out. Most of them, it's about 330 days in advance, but the numbers can vary depending on the airline. And of course, low cost airlines, they do it closer to departure. But if you're looking 330 days in advance, it's a placeholder schedule. Uh, it definitely won't be flown as is. There will be schedule changes. But the airlines are also not looking to heavily discount at that point. It's so far out. They don't expect bookings to happen that far out. And so it's really once you start getting closer to travel, and by closer, I still mean months, <laughs> but, you know, not 11 months. Uh, that's when the airlines start actively trying to manage these things. And so it will depend. Uh, you know, if, if you're talking Christmas, peak season for something, uh, you know, if you want to go to Australia for Christmas, it's probably not going to get cheaper. Those flights are full. They will be full. They will fill those things every Christmas from here to the end of time. Um, but if you're talking about, you know, a lot of people like to go to Europe in September or October after the, the kids are back in school. Uh, you know, those are the types of things that you want to start. You do want to wait until the airlines start actually actively managing those fares, because if they do see weakness, then they'll consider, do we put sale fares in or do we open up more availability at the low fares that are already filed? But at the very beginning, they're not really inclined to discount much because it's so early. Brett, it's um, 
eight o'clock on the East Coast, oh. five o'clock your time, but we've still got these questions. I'm just wondering, do you have like 10 more minutes yes. just to go really quickly through these remaining? Because I just imagine all these people, they need to buy their airline tickets and they're <laughs> desperate for an answer. So maybe we could just like quickly go through and in a, right. just a few more minutes. Is that possible? Rapid fire around. Let's do it. Okay. Okay. Do so Janine asked, how about traveling this spring? Are there still good airfares to be had? There can be. It depends where you're going. Um, but absolutely, uh, you know, it, it depends if you're talking about spring break in Florida, maybe not. But if you're going a little bit more off the beaten path uh, and, or if you're talking about, you know, later April, May, something like that before summer really kicks off. Absolutely. You can still find decent options uh, and, you know, that it's look around. Yeah, great. OK. Um Harry is asking any suggestions as to how to plan for and maximize opportunities, if any, via fifth freedom flights to Australia, New Zealand, and Singapore for Q1 of 2024. Well, um, so fifth freedom, this is not a short answer, Wendy. <laughs> I, I, I know, I know. I, I'm. <laughs> Fifth freedom flights are when one airline flies between two points. One airline from country A flies between like country B and country C. Um, so for example, Singapore Airlines flies like LA to Tokyo. Uh, there aren't really fifth freedom flying opportunities down to Australia. I mean, potentially Singapore to Tokyo and then on to Singapore and then to Australia. I'm not, I'm not sure. I, we definitely need to know more details on that, but um, Q1 is peak time to Australia. So they're probably, you know, it's not going to be the easiest thing to find any spectacular deals, but it is early. The, the flights aren't really selling past uh, the end of 23 at this point, for the most part, whatever 330 days is from today. I think Australia and New Zealand are just tough in general. They are. They're really tough. Yeah. yeah. Um, Let's see here. Um, Robin is asking, do you see any increase in online transparency from airlines about the availability of seats or upgrades with miles? Now you mostly have to either call or use a third party site to see what is available. That'd be nice, right? Uh, probably not. There is, in terms of general transparency, there are some rules that are working their way through the, the DOT, through the government, but that's more around fees and things like that, not availability of upgrades. Those aren't really on the radar that I've seen. Um, I, I wouldn't expect to see much. You know, if this is something that you're regularly doing, then it's worth considering a subscription to a site like Expert Flyer uh, or some of these other um, third parties like Point.me or Award logic that can kind of help you to, to see availability because the airlines, it's not really in their interest to make it easier for you. Right. Douglas is asking, is it better to book on Tuesdays? No. <laughs> that, I know that's a little too quick. Yeah. Uh, so this is something that goes back to the early days of the internet where like Tuesday night into Wednesday, they had these saver fairs. It's not, it's not really a thing anymore. So day of week, there isn't uh, anything that, that says one day a week will get you a better fare than the other. Ray asks, when should I book Italy in October? Italy in October. So definitely past peak. It's still going to be busier this year than you might expect, I would say. Uh, but, you know, I, I think this is the kind of thing that you can start looking. So th this is how we would approach this if someone came to us with a request for October. We'd say, all right, well, we can take a look now. Let's just see what's out there. And honestly, if you're happy with what you see, just take it. it, it you know, there's no reason to wait and say, well, maybe I could squeeze out another $100 or something. Just see what the options that are there and you can start thinking about it now. I would say that, you know, once you get into March, April, um, toward early summer, that's when you probably want to want to pull the trigger if you are waiting and hoping that it'll go down or you know maybe it's not within your budget and, and you don't want to settle for a lower class of service so you know once you get to early summer that's probably the time to do that uh, but there's no no reason to not start looking now 
Um, I'm not sure this is going to be a quick one. Nancy <laughs> asks, can you speak about Honolulu to Tashkent? Honolulu to Tashkent. Honolulu to, I know. I'm 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 jealous of that. that That's trip. amazing. I mean, your best bet, honestly, is probably uh, United and Turkish. So, you know, you can fly United somewhere on the mainland and then Turkish through Istanbul. Um, might be some opportunities to go through Asia. But yeah, that's a that is definitely not one of the top routes. But that is cool. <laughs> that would be fun to, <laughs> to look at. I mean, that it could also make sense in something like that to to break it up into multiple tickets. I mean, you, you may get to a point where you say uh, you could maybe buy a ticket to Japan even uh, and go from there, or you could look at buying a ticket to just to LA um, and and trying to do it from there. But that's definitely one that I think separate tickets might be beneficial, but hard to know until you dive in. Nancy is asking, it's the same question about Italy in the fall, Italy for early September. And it sounds to me like basically, if you want to go somewhere really popular in Europe in the fall, you should be booking by about spring break or early summer. Is that? Um, of probably. I mean, three to four months out is sort of for off peak times is, is a decent gauge. You're talking early September there. So it's a little earlier than the October question. Uh, that's probably generally the sweet spot but we just don't really know and that's why i say it's good to start looking now because if things book up really well then you may miss your chance at three months out uh if they're not booking up well then it may be just fine but it's hard to know and the airlines don't tell you like hey i mean you can go to any of these websites and they say, hurry, it's booking fast, but that's all stupid and annoying and just trying to get you to buy something. Um, they won't really tell you what they're thinking. So that's kind of the tough part on that. And that's why I can't hurt to start looking now. And if you see something you like, just take it. Otherwise, keep looking and see what happens. Julianne asks a question about using consolidators. So I don't know, this is probably not a quick one either, but, or maybe it is. Um, maybe. She's asking, you know, if you use a consolidator and during travel, there's a change or delay, can I make the change or does the airline now have control of the ticket and can make a change or would I have to try to contact the consolidator? It just sounds like the issues that can happen with a consolidator ticket. Yeah, that's always an issue with consolidators. So, you know, it's, it, one thing that we have is um, the ones that that we work with, we actually have access to their system, so we don't need to talk to them, which is nice. Uh, but it, it is... For the most part, if there is an issue on your flight during travel, the airline should be the one to help you with that. You shouldn't have to go back to the consolidator um, or to Expedia or whoever it might be. But, you know, your mileage may vary, especially with the consolidator, because those tickets are sort of in a different class. Uh, and I don't mean like class of service, but they're in a bit of a different world. They don't have the actual dollar amounts on the tickets, their bulk fares, then their hidden net fare, all this kind of stuff. So um, it can be a little more complicated with consolidators. But, you know, what I would say is try everyone. <laughs> Just if you have a problem, try everyone. It can't hurt. You'll find who will help you in the end. And um, I think we've got one last question here from Jim. Will Cranky's staff help you as a consumer understand the nuances of the airline's business class options regarding quality and amenities, especially regarding some of these airlines many of us have not heard of? Yeah, I mean, a, bus a business class seats are not all created equal. So how do you, no. do you, how do you help people with that? Yeah, uh, we can. So the one thing where I think we run into trouble with this sometimes with customers is we need to know what it is you care about. Because sometimes when people say, well, is this better or is this better? Well, that's subjective. <laughs> you know, do you really care about food? Turkish is great. Uh, you know, do you care about the, the seat, the bed? You know, maybe uh, whatever airline is better. Uh, so as long as you know, we know what it is that you care about, then we can absolutely do that and go through it and say, well, this one, probably not the best for you. Um, it can, you know, also, is it two people traveling as a couple or is it one person traveling alone? Because increasingly you have the suites where everyone's isolated, but sometimes people don't want that and they want to sit with someone and actually be able to interact with them. So 
um, you know, knowing what it is that that people want to get out of the experience, then we can help. And we we know pretty extensively, you know, what the different offerings are. And so we can help with that kind of stuff. Awesome. Okay. Well, we've we've kept you long enough. Thank you so much, Brett, for for going over time and also answering everyone's um big airline questions. We so appreciate your being with us. I'm today. happy to do it. You know, at any time. You, uh, any any time you call, Wendy, I'm ready to help. <laughs> thank you, Brett. We really appreciate it, and I want to thank our audience um, for joining us, and Brooke and Carolyn, of course, for being here and asking their their questions too. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, we've got um, there's more of Wow Week coming up uh, tomorrow. Wednesday is our conversation about travel insurance and emergency assistance membership programs and when you need it, when you don't. Um, and, you know, a lot of people, it's, it's a complicated topic. A lot of people get confused. We're going to make it really simple for you. Um, and then on Thursday, Carolyn is talking about new and unusual ways to see the world by water, all kinds of cool itineraries and, and new boats and cruises on unusual waterways around the world. And then on Friday, we're going to be talking about miles and points um, with Gary Leff and how to get more of them and use them more wisely in 2023. So we hope you'll join us for those sessions. Um, if you want to sign up, you can just go to wendyperrin.com and, and uh, it's on the homepage and, and RSVP there. So thank you again so much, everyone, for joining us. We appreciate it. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye.